and I'd like to call the MWPA Executive Committee meeting of November 3rd, 2022 to order. Could you do the roll call, please, Martina? Absolutely. Director Goins? Here. Director Hilliard? Here. Director Kurtz? Here. Director McMillan? Here. And President Redoni? President. Thank you. Item three is the any agenda adjustments. Does anyone want to change the agenda in any way today? No. Okay. Seeing no suggested changes, we're going to move to item four, which is open time for public expression. The public is welcome to address the executive committee at this time on matters not on the agenda that are within the jurisdiction of the committee. Please be advised that pursuant to the government code section, the committee is not permitted to discuss or take action on any matters not on the agenda. Comments may be no longer than three minutes and should be respectful to the community. A reminder, please silence your phones and mute your devices when not speaking. So we'll go to open time comments, Martina. Thank you, sir. And if there are any members of the public wishing to speak on items not currently on the agenda, Please, if you are joining us by phone, press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself. Otherwise, if you are joining us here virtually, pre please raise your hand in the reactions. And sir, we do not have any public comments at this time. Thank you. So we'll move to item five now, executive officer's verbal report. Good morning, everybody. Um, hope you're doing well. Um, I know the weather has been, uh, we're definitely in a season change, aren't we? Um, had that little bit of rain and then we um, now have that frost alert, at least for some of the valleys had a frost alert. I know it was 35 degrees when I woke up this morning at my house. So um, definitely change in the weather and obviously a welcome change. Um, so recent fires, there are no recent fires to talk about. Um, fuel moisture is kind of interesting. Um, the 10 hour fuels are obviously quite moist, but the 100 hour fuels are actually still a little bit below normal values for this time of year. Um, and that makes sense if you think about uh, normally we've had, had an inch or two of rain by now, um, where we've only had about it. Um, well, we've actually had So um, what this has done, the VMP, the prescribed fire that I talked about um, last week or two weeks ago up at Rock Springs, we're hoping to be able to perform it um, tomorrow, but the, the fuel moisture may not be conducive to that. I am getting a, um, a thing where that says my internet is unstable, so please give me the high sign if I pause out or anything. Um, I also wanted to mention that we received a thank you letter from the Marin County Hazmat team. They hosted a series of three day train or a series of trainings over a three day period and had between two and 300 of the firefighters of Marin County attend the meeting. Um, you know, large meeting spaces like that for the public safety agencies in uh, easy to access place. It's actually there's not very many in the county. So it was really they really appreciated being able to use this. And there's a little I have a little strategy behind this, too. Um, believe it or not, I bet you almost half of the line firefighters are not terribly aware of the MWPA. Um, and I can speak from experience. There is a disconnect between the line and the prevention world. And so uh, by bringing those folks into the NWPA offices, I think we um, indoctrinate them into what is the MWPA is about and they can help spread that message. And also the more we get the public to come into our offices, the more they're gonna learn about it. So that's one of our uh, strategies there. Um, December 9th, the MWPA staff will be um, having an offsite meeting for um, planning and staff development. And our planning is gonna be surrounding, not necessarily creating program management for all the items in the work plan, but it's program management that staff is doing to support the efforts of the MWPA and our member agencies. So we're really looking forward to having that offsite session. This will be the third one that we've had and the other two have been widely successful. So we're looking forward to this third one. Uh, we will be having a site visit November 15th at Nevada Memorial Park. It was an MWPA funded project that Nevada initiated. Um, and it's, it's both fire um, reduction as well as um, rehabilitation. A large eucalyptus grove has been removed and then Memorial Park will continue with the rehabilitation and the restoration back to a grass oakland savanna. 
Um, recently, uh, Farhad Mansourian asked me to uh, present at um, a series that he teaches at Dominican University, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. He was teaching about the layers of government, and his last session was on joint powers agreements. And so he asked me to speak about joint powers agreements. But what he really was doing was providing me an opportunity to talk about how great the MWPA is to, to a, a group of citizens. And so we talked about our mission. We talked about everything we're doing, got a lot of positive feedback. And quite frankly, this group that was attending was a group that thinks that we have too many government entities. So for them to speak and be positive about it, yet another government entity was great. And just a little side story. Uh, we had a lady in there that lives in Novato Heights. And after I got finished, she said, I just want to say everything you said is true. You guys are actually doing everything you said. We've leveraged, um, we've created a Firewise community. We've used your chipper days. We've get your DSpace inspections. We've used your grant. I mean, and so she was just going over the top. It was great hearing such a positive result. Um, I had a really fascinating meeting with uh, Scripps Institute yesterday. Um, and they do a ton of research, mostly in weather and oceanography, but they want to um, dip their toes into wildfire and specifically um, um, some research that will help wildfire mitigation. Uh, two of the areas that they we talked about yesterday was uh, long-term weather predictions to help support um, prescribed fire, and then also analyzing the soils before a fire occurs so that we can find out where um, we are most at risk for post-fire debris flows. And perhaps that could be used as a tool to help prioritize our work. So we can make sure that not only are we um, hitting the areas that we know are of the greatest risk, but we can add, if there is a fire, this is an area that can have a massive debris flow post-fire, and we can start focusing some of our efforts towards those areas. Um, we had a very knowledgeable meteorologist in, in the room, and I think you all know how much I love talking to meteorologists, so I, I, I had a blast in that conversation. And my last thing is um, IBHS update keeps popping up on my reports only because we have so much momentum, um, and I'm so excited about it. Uh, so we are looking at um, we've analyzed our data. We've come up with 500 homes throughout the county that are either can be approved as a wildfire prepared home now or are one or two easy steps away from being approved. We want to narrow that down to 25 um, beta test homes throughout the county. In order to select those 25, you know, the data only paints so much of a picture. So we are gonna tap into each of our DSpace manage, um, inspection managers at our member agencies, share the list of what we think the data shows as, as possible um, candidates and make sure we get their feedback and they approve of who we're pushing forward. We want to um, run the first beta test of five homes as early as December. And then with the ultimate goal of getting to our 25 homes by May, if the beta test is successful, that's when we'll draft up a formal agreement to bring to the board for approval. And one thing, um, very, very tentative at this time, but um, it sounds like IBHS will be on Good Morning America in May. And they will have a wildfire prepared home in their lab next to a non-wildfire prepared home. And they actually mentioned this. I don't know if it's not a promise, but it's a, a, a goal that we could help work towards. And that is they want to have a successful beta test with Marin so that they can announce that type of work during Good Morning America. So very tentative, not a promise, but um, something for us to look forward to. And with that, I'll stop the screen share and take any questions. Thanks, Mark. So questions of the executive officer. Yeah, Rachel. Great update, Mark. Um, IBHS, just as if you're using that uh, acronym, probably just explain it's the home insurance. Um, yeah, yeah. In Institute for Insurance uh, Business and Home Safety. Thank you. Right, thanks. Um, with that, are we managing it as a project within uh, MWPA? Yes, and we are. So, so maybe we, we continue to sort of what our role is in terms of how much work and effort that that's that project in of itself is taking because it's real it is one of our goals and objectives it's part of that but maybe we we help define it out as a as a specific project um as we're going through it we it's actually taking more cycles now 
Yeah, um, and we actually did create a um, a zero cost project within the work plan that we could start affiliating this work towards. We knew that we wanted to do it. We just, but we knew we could be able to do it within the resources without actually expending core funds for it. So okay. yeah, we'll start connecting it to that. Right. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, thank you. Um, just following up on that question, Mark, are you anticipating that the IBHS folks will be reimbursing MWPA for defensible space inspections? They wouldn't be re reimbursing us for the inspections, but it will be a cost benefit for our members because the members, uh, not our member agencies, but our residents, excuse me, because in order to get the IBHS designation, you need to pay IBHS $125 for that inspection. They will be discounting or waiving that $125 based on a relationship that we have. So we are, our taxpayers will see a direct um, cost benefit for that. And then we anticipate that the insurance companies will use the IBHS process to align to the uh, um, safer regulations that Cal California has put in place, that all insurance companies must provide a discount if people have met these standards. And we don't think the insurance companies are going to go off on their own and create their own programs. We imagine that they will um, piggyback on the IBHS's program. So it's going to be a huge benefit for our residents. Okay, that's awesome. And then two other just quick questions. I'm wondering if the hazmat team, did they pay, did they pay to rent the space or did we just give them that space gratis? We, we are not allowed to sublet. Ah. So any any use of that room can't be um, a, fee, a fee for service. Uh -huh. uh, so we are seeing it as a, a, um, a benefit for our member agencies being part of the MWPA. Okay. And then lastly, the November 15th uh, Novato Memorial Park site visit. I'm just wondering if you could provide more specifics and then maybe later send around an invitation to the entire board. You, you bet. We have it on social media um, at the location and the flyer. And um, we also have it on our community calendar and Anne can fill in some more details. Sure. Uh, so this project is one that the board approved and includes 1.4 acres of eucalyptus removal. There was disease within that eucalyptus stand as well, and so it was particularly hazardous. And so the project um, also overlaps a riparian area. So we've been coordinating with the Department of Fish and Wildlife on a permit and a restoration plan as well. So the project includes not only eucalyptus removal, but also replanting with native plants that are resistant to the particular pathogen that's on the site. So uh, when folks um, join us on the 15th, and that's from 10 to noon on the 15th, uh, they'll be able to see um, where the eucalyptus trees have been removed, but also we're gonna show uh, replanting um, plans and uh, species lists and things like that and talk about what the replanting is gonna look like. And so happy to send out the flyer. Um, it was, uh, let's see, we have social media posts ready to go. Uh, we're gonna be sending out additional information. Is that the project that Mike Sweezy was mentioning on the, okay. So what, yes. what's about the approximate cost of that? Around a hundred thousand. Three hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, more in the three hundred range, I think. Um, the eucalyptus removal is quite expensive, but I recall that the the quotes that he was getting were uh, more reasonable than he was expecting. Um, he was able to pull in some funding from other projects to help complete the project in a faster time frame. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I can just add, there was there's 350 that was budgeted, but he actually was surprised by the quote that came in. I think it was closer in the 180,000 range, and then it will be Memorial Park that has to do the restoration efforts. Yeah, the uh, private landowner is going to be taking on the monitoring um, and uh, maintenance of the project area. Perfect. Thank you. Bruce? That's great. Yeah, so um, I, I just wanted to mention that <clears throat> at, at the Nevada Fire Protection District board meeting last month, uh, we had a member of the public ask about this project and was concerned that um, we were we were spending money, a substantial amount of money, on a on a, a, a private uh, you know commercial site. Um, so I, I I explained you know basically our policy and that. Um, you know, the interpretation that we'd received from Megan in previous years in regards to, 
you know, you know use of funds um, on, on various ownerships and it was permissible. But I just want you to be aware, Mark and Anne and, and, and um, Mike, I think knows this, that we really need to underscore the, um, the responsibilities of that, of that landowner in the restoration work. And then the, the key, you can plant something, but it, it goes nowhere unless you maintain it. They're in perpetuity, they're responsible for, for the maintenance of, of, the, of the restored vegetation. So just be, and just to be aware that, that this may come up at the meeting. I don't know how public this is gonna be, but again, it's someone asking, why are you spending so much money on somebody on a private commercial parcel? Um, and the, the, the point being also that there, there are, you know, uh, probably several thousand commercial parcels that are contributing um, that will receive nothing frankly, because they don't need to, to upgrade. So I think we just need to have your logic and response ready. You might get questions from the public on at this meeting. And this this project abuts um, dozens of homes that are in, uh, immediately threatened by the eucalyptus growth. So there actually is a, a significant community fire reduction that's being created. And there, there's also a, a, a landowner there who um, has taken issue with this and challenged it. And um, I'm not sure how that's been resolved, but there were some sensitivities uh, to um, them losing um, the beauty of the trees and, you know, what they consider to be, you know, their, their, their right uh, to, to a beautiful view. And I think the project was modified to accommodate their, their issues. But again, that, that's, it's, you know, that, that, that may come up also. So just, just to be prepared to, to address all those issues. Julie, go ahead. Yeah, just following up on that, and I'm sure you'll you you and your team will do a great job. I think rather than anticipating questions at the event, it might be better just to be on the offensive and you know paint the picture of the story from the outset rather than having people attack. Good suggestion, Julie. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, we'll go to the public now. Martina. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak on the executive officer's report, if you're joining us by phone, please press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself. Otherwise, if you're joining us here virtually, please raise your hand in the reactions to um, deliver your comment. And sir, it does not appear that we have any hands for public comment at this time. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna bring it back to the committee for further discussion, no action is required. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to item six, the consent calendar. Opportunity for the public to comment on the consent calendar will occur prior to the committee's discussion of the consent calendar. Today, we only have one item on the consent calendar. So I'm going to actually move to the public comment now. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak on the consent item, please raise your hand in the reactions if you're joining us virtually. Otherwise, if you're joining us by phone, please press star nine to raise your hand and star six to speak. And sir, we do not have any public comments. Okay, bringing it back to the committee. Any questions, comments, or a motion for the consent calendar? I move except to approve the consent calendar. Thank you, Catherine. Julie? Second. Been moved by Hilliard, second by McMillan. Roll call, please. Director Goins. Aye. Director Hilliard. Aye. Director Kurtz. Aye. Director McMillan. Aye. President Rodoni. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> Item seven is committee reports. Uh, do we have a report from the Citizens Oversight Committee today? And I do see Pat Randolph in the audience, so we can bring her over as a panelist to offer a report. And she will be joining us in just a second. Thank you, sirs. Good morning, Member Randolph. You should be able to take yourself off mute to deliver your committee report. Welcome, uh, Pat. Uh, good morning, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I know you have a very full agenda today, so I won't take up much of your time. Uh, just to let you know that um, the Citizens Oversight Committee is uh, busy working on uh, the annual report for the year that finished uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, July, end of June. 
Um, and um, we're hard at work also to know that we've combined our uh, November and December meetings uh, since our November meeting was on the eve of Thanksgiving. Uh, we decided it was best not to meet then uh, and are going to have a meeting in early December. Uh, so if anyone wants to join us, you are welcome. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions that anyone has. Thank you, Pat. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Dennis, if I can add just a couple items, um, and I think I mentioned this at the board meeting, but um, I've already met with our auditors, so we are on pace to have a much earlier release for our audit, which will definitely help with the annual report for the COC. And then um, COC has had some great information requests that we've been providing information back to them quickly. And um, I just have a, a little bit of cleanup for the year-end reports for our member agencies in regard to DSpace and, and local projects that we'll be able to package up and deliver to the COC so that the COC doesn't have to go to each member agency. Thank you. And for that, we are very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Any additional questions or comments from the committee? All right, let's go to the public on this item then. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak on the Citizens Oversight Committee report, please raise your hand in the reactions if you're joining us virtually or press star nine to raise your hand if you're joining us by phone. And sir, we do not have any public comments. Okay, bring it back to the committee for discussion. There's no action required. Bruce? Hi, yeah, just very briefly at our uh, Novato Fire Protection Board meeting, um, a couple of days ago, we had a question about. I understand that there are there are four positions now that are, that have come to term, and that um, we'll we'll getting some new new candidates, or perhaps those that are currently serving will stand up and offer to to serve another term, which would be fantastic. But this is maybe for for Mark and for Pat. I was asked how who's handling the outreach. What is your outreach plan to 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 get new candidates uh, uh, to get candidates for the COC? Um, so Mark, Mark, um, it more maybe more for Mark, but I, I, I really all I knew is that we um, we have done outreach several times. We've we've had a, a couple of cycles, and I, I frankly I didn't have the question. I said, well, you're going to need to talk to to Mark or or find out from what the committee what's going on. So can you just give me a cliff note version that I can share back with my board? You you bet. We um, we actually have a pretty good system in place now. We have um, we create a news article within our website that's attached to that gives them a link to the application. We go through a series of um, different social media posts. There will be an ad in the um, Ren IJ in the middle of the month on a weekend. And then since there is a Novato position open, we're also going to have an ad with the Novato patch. And then we ask our member agencies um, and our board members if they and COC members if they have any candidates they think are are appropriate to reach out personally. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. That's fantastic. And that, and that's my plan too. I have been actively reaching out to people I know who I think would be uh, good to serve on the committee. Great. Thank. Thank you, Pat. That's great. Thanks. I think I have the information I need. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mark and Pat. I think we can move on now then. We're going to move to item eight, discussion items. This is the draft strategic plan and next steps. Mark? Good. Uh, uh, I'm, we've been very excited about the strategic planning that's been going on behind the scenes. And one of the things I've learned is that um, strategic planning is often not very visible to those who aren't intimately involved. And so it sometimes... Um, uh, gives the impression that it isn't happening at all. I, re I remember when I was assigned to the Thomas Fire, some of my bosses were going, you guys are not being strategic with your planning at all when we were. So when we brought them in and showed them what we're doing, they're going, aha, I get it. So um, that's where what we're trying to accomplish is to, to assure the board that we are um, on uh, a well-guided path for our strategic plan. The document that is um, attached to this is definitely not a final document because we're only about halfway through our strategic planning, um, but it does document what has been approved by the board so far. And that's our mission and vision um, statements, our values and our goals and our objectives that are attached to each one of those goals. Uh, what we are working on is the measures of success. And thank you, Bruce, for pointing this out. And, and it's funny when you write, 
you 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 think you're writing what you think you want to say and you actually switch the words and i had a lot of places where i wanted to put outputs and i put outcome and so outputs are easy to document outcomes are not so we will be making the change to that staff report when we publish it for the board because the outcomes are really what we want to find and measure um and then um if you guys are used to uh dealing with the level of intelligence and how smart she is um and reading what charlotte uh, jordan writes for us a lot you you may have noticed that there's there's a lot of charlotte's fingerprints all over that staff report and our overall strategic planning process and so she'll, she'll be a key member for that um we one of the things we need to do to measure is we need to know what our baseline is and so for many of the goals goals one three and five the uh, the partial level risk assessment is our our, our our provides some of the baseline and then we need to figure out how to measure the changes and so that's where the project with willow labs sti and fireside that we are going to be presenting a, the results of a beta test soon and that's um, actually measuring the amount of um, the decrease in home ignitability that we've accomplished through our defensible space and home hardening efforts, the change in fire behavior that we will see through our shaded fuel breaks and our evacuation route clearing. And again, those all align with goals one, three, and five. Those, and that project is, is on time and on budget. Then the um, fire safe marine survey that we discussed last meeting and our knowledge, is, knowledge and attitude survey that's going to step off of that. Um, will help determine our public outreach and education baseline, which is goal four. And then our evac ingress egress risk assessment um, will help us establish the baseline for goal two. And all this work will help us give us quantifiable outcomes to measure for and create. Um, and that's how we can get into finalizing um, our strategic plan. And definitely we'll be bringing those measures of success for approval to the full board. And then we can uh, um, adopt a strategic plan. We feel that we have almost all the resources we need to accomplish this minus one key position, and then that is a GIS consultant. Much of this um, measuring our success is going to be GIS intensive, and we simply don't have those resources within the MWPA, and the GIS resources within our member agencies are pretty much tapped. So staff has been working on a RFP for a GIS consultant that we'll be bringing to the board for approval. Um, it's not only would be for the strategic plan, but it would also be for our project and work plan development, because everything we're doing is, is GIS based. And so we feel that we need to increase that bandwidth within the MWPA. And with that, I'll take questions. Julie, first question, go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Um, two questions. I'm just wondering if you have an approximate range of costs that the GIS consultant will will need. <laughs> Did you hear that, Mark? Uh -oh. My internet is, is getting okay. wonky again. Um, so if you can hear me, um, yeah. that's we haven't got to gotten to that. I, I did. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we don't have that estimate yet. As we work on the RFP, we'll put a, 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 a do not exceed cost in there, but we haven't been able to identify that value yet. Is it like 5,000 or 50? I mean, what's the magnitude? Do you have any idea? I wouldn't be surprised if it gets into um, 50,000 a year. Wow. Okay. And then um, my other question was, um, I recall that there was a an ad hoc board subcommittee um, that helped with the strategic planning process early on. And I'm just wondering if that uh, ad hoc committee or a different group is being reconvened to help with this. So the group that we initially intend to reconvene is a task force of advisory technical committee members operations committee members led by staff, primarily um, the and the, the main facilitator is Charlotte. And then um, we can convene an ad hoc subcommittee of the board if we feel like that's helpful or if we are if we feel like we have the direction that we need then we can just bring it to the whole board. I, I was just going to suggest that if there is if you feel that it's necessary to have another subcommittee, 
Um, I would recommend that Stephen Burke be added or included in that committee. That's right up his alley. Thank you very much for that suggestion. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Catherine? Hi, yes, I was also gonna talk about Stephen. I think he's really good at this, but I wanted to compliment you. I'm so I use myself as somebody who is, um, you know, the, the public. This is one of the finest documents that I've read and it's so well summarized with um, visual aids and charts and all. And it really clearly says to me what our mission is. And also the fact that we've been accumulating data for the first two years of, um, as we are also being productive, I, it's outstanding as far as I'm concerned um, for general public. So thank you so much. This is really a good document. Thank you. And wait till you see the annual report. <laughs> All right, Bruce. Uh, here, here on Stephen, who would replace Sashi, who was uh, a member of the team. And uh, Catherine, I also agree the excellence of this. This is a, an astounding document. I, I do want to just re, uh, again mention something that uh, I mentioned last year, or something that is not specifically being identified for tracking, but it is mark how we're doing on implementation of the projects contained within the Marin County Wildfire Prevention Plan, CWPP. There are over 300 projects in there. They're rated very high, high, moderate. And um, it just it just it just suggests, Mark, that we find a way to to uh, maintain tracking of that uh, of that document also, because it is a commitment that was made, uh, you know, to, to the citizens. And then we we took that responsibility as as the authority to get that done. So if you could please just consider how we can weave that into the um, the the out the outputs and outcome assessment. That We've actually built that into our work plan portal. There's okay. actually a checkbox in the um, um, project development piece that says if this is a CWPP project or not. So we actually have a really good mechanism for that. Thank you, Mark. I I, I lost track of that. Thank you. Of the two hundred thousand things we got going at once, and you, you, didn't, <laughs> you didn't keep track of that. Come on. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Terrific. Any other questions? No, thanks, Mark. I agree. Really great report. And if you want to reconvene the ad hoc committee, I certainly would be willing to do that. I do think Stephen would be a good one. I think Gabe is with someone I'd want to continue yep. to, but maybe we could open it up to a couple others too. You know, it's a great way. Um, these ad hoc subcommittees are a great way to get uh, more of our board members involved and informed. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, go to the public now for public comment. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak on the current item on the agenda, please raise your hand in the reactions if you're joining us virtually. If you're joining us by phone, please press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself. And it looks like we do have a comment from a Stephen Keese in the attendees. Um, talking has been permitted for Stephen Keese's comment. Thank you, Martina. Uh, I just want to uh, state, I, I guess, my usual thing. You guys are a very impressive bunch of people. Uh, Julie, Catherine, Rachel, your comments, um, and Dennis, you run a good meeting. Um, it's just, it's, I, I feel real proud, and I tell people this, of having been part of getting this whole thing together. Thank you guys for, for doing it. And, and of course, Mark and Ann, you, you guys do great stuff. Anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Anything else, Martina? President Rodoni, it does not appear that we have any additional attendees for public comments. Okay. Um, I think Director Hilliard still has her hand up. I think she's clapping. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> All right. We'll bring you back to the committee for further discussion. No action is required. All right. So we'll move on to 8B now, Mark. Timeline for in-person meetings. Yeah. And I think um, the, the, the process of getting to, and I don't, 
I, I purposely didn't say to return to in-person meetings since we have never actually had in-person <laughs> meetings for any of our Brown Act meetings. Um, I think there's going to be mixed reviews. I think some people have become really, really comfortable and, and love the virtual environment. And then there's are, are people that um, miss the, the personal interaction that we get and the benefit from that personal interaction that we get from in-person meetings. As you know, um, during the declaration of emergency or state of emergency for COVID, um, AB 361 allows the meetings in the format that we have been providing. Um, and then uh, the governor has stated that the um, end of the state of emergency will be February of 2023. So that's when Assembly Bill 2449 kicks in, which is the amendments to the Brown Act that somewhat makes it easier to, to attend um, remotely as a, a board member or a committee member. But all it really did was made it so you didn't have to make sure that your hotel room was accessible and that you posted the agenda on somewhere in that hotel room or, or conference center that you're at. Now is about the only change. Um, I won't go into all of the details, but um, our chamber, our board chambers slash classroom development is, is going fantastic. Um, Ren TV has been pounding away for the past uh, week and a half. Uh, I've seen the quality of their work, the quality of the equipment that they're putting in for us. And I think it's going to be a fantastic environment, both for board meetings, but also for our classroom sessions that are being set up will be set up very well for uh, meetings um, whether it's fully in person or a hybrid learning environment where certain, some people can be in person, some people can be remote. The timeline for the completion of that room is such that we will be able to beta test it before we ever have our first um, Brown Act meeting. We don't want a um, trial by fire. And um, so, as you know, we are scheduling our first hybrid meeting to be at a board of directors meeting in December. So we will have some test runs before that. Um, the timeline to get to uh, full compliance to Assembly Bill 2449 has, uh, I, I provided three options. One is to continue hybrid meetings following the board meeting in December. And then in March, we go to the fully in-person meetings. Option two is return to the full remote environment after the board meeting in December, and then comply in uh, March to 2449. And option three is after the... Um, um, uh, the board meeting in December, just go straight to complying to 2449. Uh, staff recommends option one, um, and that is to uh, continue our hybrid fashion that's compliant to 361, but it still has the in-person um, uh, quality to it for those who want to attend in person and then move into the um, fully in-person meetings in March. Okay, Mark, thank you. So questions, please, Julie. Um, thank you, Mark. Could you just describe briefly what you mean when you say hybrid? Hybrid meaning that uh, board members who choose to be in person can be in person. Board members who choose to be remote can be remote. And the public would have the same option? Yes, thank you for um, completing that thought for me. Other questions? Julie, I mean, Rachel, sorry. <laughs> um, can we think about like all board meetings are in person and all exec meetings are uh, hybrid? I'm just trying to make sure, I mean, can we, it doesn't have to be all or none, right? True. There's a way of looking at it. Um, also, and I'm sorry if I missed this, if we're in, if we're doing hybrid and the board members, just speaking of the board members, um, would we need to have a quorum in person? Not, not during the state of emergency. Once the state of emergency goes away, then yes, we have to have a quorum in person. And while during the state of emergency under 361, we would not have to have a quorum in person. And Megan can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and actually, just one point of clarification there, too, is that we have AB 2449 coming into effect, which has these very specific requirements about um, how often you can um, utilize those provisions, whether it's emergency or um, for cause. But um, there's also the existing Brown Act um, teleconferencing, which is still available to everyone. So under that, um, you don't 
have a limited number of times that you can do it. But as Mark alluded to, you would have to post on your um, hotel room or at your home, and that address would be on the publicly available agenda. And so there's some privacy concerns. I know for um, a lot of legislative body members who aren't aren't really excited about having all that information public. So I think AB 2449 fills in and allows for a little more privacy, but then it comes with a lot of strings attached as well. Um, so just on the quorum piece of that, if anyone is utilizing AB 2449, um, then a quorum does need to be in one single location. Um, but if there's no one using AB 2449 and you're just using traditional Brown Act, then the majority of participants must be in the jurisdiction. So they don't have to all be together necessarily. But again, um, because AB 2449 has that requirement, as soon as it's triggered, then we would need a quorum in one location. So for options um, one and two, we would need to continue the AB 361 um, resolution for each of our um, once a month. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm thinking just beyond exactly. If we if we stick with AB 361, it simplifies things through the end of February. And then we'll have to start thinking logistically about how to get everyone's addresses to Martina in advance of the posting of the agenda and all those type of things that that are likely to come up or um, or doing the emergency or for cause um, reasoning for each of the AB 2449 pieces. So it'll be more moving parts for agenda formation at that time. No, I appreciate, I think, the clarification. It's about as clear as mud. Um, <laughs> so I think that this has the potential of being an administrative nightmare in terms of actually managing it. And as much as I, I totally appreciate the flexibility of hybrid and not hybrid. I think there's, first of all, if we, some people say they're going to show and then they don't show and then we don't have a quorum and what are we going to do? And it, it has the potential of being chaotic. Um, and so I wonder as we look, look ahead in terms of how do we best simplify it, not only for the board members, but for the public. And, and I appreciate, you know, again, the flexibility, the idea that people can be everywhere. But because of the laws and the rules and the decisions we're making and the amount of money that we're talking about, um, I, and to for staff or Martina to try to manage all the administrative details around this, I think we need to figure out the most simplified approach. Um, and if that means we're all in person, we're all in person. If it means we're all hybrid, we're all hybrid, you know, whatever it or online, I don't even know. Can we not all, we can't all be on, on online anymore. Sorry, well, we still can until March. I'm, I'm saying post-March. Oh, well, post-March, yeah. Yeah, post-March. So, so at that point, so thinking about post-March, what is the simplest, cleanest way so it's clear for everybody? Well, post-March, we have no, no um, options. We have to comply to 2449. And it does, and, it, and 2449, stipulates the option for remote attendance from um, board or committee members. So it, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. It's, it's that transition period between now and then is really the decision. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I kind of agree with Rachel. I think we don't want to make this a real administrative nightmare for staff and to try and simplify it and make a recommendation. I guess the question I have, you mentioned December. Is there anything magical about December? No, it's just when we had decided to do our first hybrid meeting and also have an open house okay. for the um, our new offices and have just a, um, an opportunity for our member agencies, ops committee, advisory technical committee, COC, to, to see the facility and en enjoy each other's company. Sure. Okay, that makes sense. So, so my preference, I think, would be to ask everyone to be in person of the board, but that wouldn't exclude it being hybrid for the public. The public can have their choice to be in person or be hybrid, but I think it makes it much simpler for, for administration of this if board members are just asked to be in person. And I think that there can be exceptions um, if someone has an emergency or whatever. But, but I think the recommendation should be, my personal feeling recommendation is that board members be in person whenever we start it. If it's December, that's fine, or January or April. But, but I think April, they have to be in person. But it's sort of going to the April rule now, I guess, would require everyone to be in person. 
unless they have extenuating circumstances and can meet the 20, 24 to 49 rules. And if I may just, I, I know I, I may not be making any of this clear and every every municipal attorney that I've talked to and <laughs> public agency attorney is equally frustrated with the complexity because AB 2449 seems to uh, offer us more options, but it actually complicates things a bit because of all the hoops you have to hop through to actually have an individual member utilize it. So um, I think that things, there will be um, between now and March, there may be some um, guidance that we can offer that'll sort of, there may be some repairs done to the bill between now and then that may help us um, work with it more clearly because I think a lot, especially for large agencies like this one, um, it does complicate things if you have some people utilizing the 2449 and others utilizing just your traditional teleconferencing requirements. Um, it just adds, as everyone's mentioned, the administrative burden. Um, so we can recommend that um, board members attend in person, but you can't necessarily mandate it because state law allows for these options for them to follow um, if they want to. So um, I think the the hope is that um, as long as AB 361 findings can be made, which is what the county has been doing so far too, um, we have the more flexibility and then we can hopefully, as we get closer to um, that, allowance going away and that freedom of AB 361 going away, we'll have more clarity potentially from the state on how to best implement the hybrid model. Bruce? I, uh, Catherine's hand was up first, uh, Dennis, if-, if um... Go ahead. Go ahead, Catherine, sorry. So I think <clears throat> what this does actually, I agree with meeting in person. But I, what I also think is it goes back to the way we had it before this emergency was declared, before AB uh, 361, we did have to post where if at our house, and, and I don't, I do think that our board has the power to declare an emergency. Let's say we have a king tide, a rainstorm, and we can't get together. I think that we can declare an emergency at any time and go back to video conferencing. Is that true, Megan? The AB, board? Um, well, AB 2449, we can't, um, we can't declare an emergency universally for, um, but we can use the emergency provisions of AB 2449, which would say that the board has found that it's, um, these certain provisions have been satisfied, um, and it constitutes an emergency, and the, therefore these members cannot locate or cannot come to a single meeting space. But there, it's strange, even though it has that component to it, it also has the requirement that a quorum meet in a single location. So even if you're, if individual members are utilizing the emergency, you don't have the freedom to, um, to I think we would just have to cancel the meeting if not everyone, if, if we couldn't pull a quorum together in an immediate location. Um, and if people were uncomfortable having their home addresses listed on that agenda. Thank you for clearing that up. Thank you. Yeah. Bruce? Uh, this is a, a question, um, and, and I, I support Dennis. I, su I support your position also, and Rachel. I think we do need to keep this as simple as possible. M my question is to what constitutes a quorum or MWPA. Uh, Rachel, uh, you represent San Rafael, which is like twenty-eight and something percent. I represent Nevada, which is twenty-four point seven, I think, or eight. You and I in combined make over we make almost fifty-three percent of the county. And if I'm sick and you're sick. Uh, can we have a can we have a quorum if if we only have forty percent forty eight percent of the populace uh, represented in a meeting? I just need this for clarity. Thank you. I may be able to respond to that, Mark, if that's helpful. Go for it. I figured you would. Um, so we have a two tiered um, voting, which is where that that percentage piece comes in. But in terms of a straight quorum, we just rely on the numbers of. So we would need nine members in person for the board and three for this. So. Um, we may not be able to take action on an item. Um, well, actually, no, um, Megan, the, the, the stipulation is it's the percentage piece comes into um, play for the members that are at the meeting. Oh, that's right. Yes, you're right. So it does, it adjusts automatically for whoever's, whoever's there. So it's true. We could conduct business even without, um, without you two here. I mean, we'd love to have you, <laughs> but um, but the quorum question up front is just that we can only function if we have a, a, the right number of people um, participating. It doesn't have to do with the who 
the percentage of the population they represent. Yeah, it, it, so just to clarify, Bruce. Yeah, thank you. So, um, and I'll, I'll use a specific example, whereas if we have all of our board members present, then of course we are gonna be able to have 100% of the population represented. Therefore, 51% of the population would have to have voted yes through their board member. However, let's say we have you not in attendance and I'm gonna make the math easy, say that, that Nevada is 25%. That means 75% of the population is present. However, we only need 50% plus one of that 75% to vote yes. Thank, you, to make for, it easy to thank you for clarifying that for me. <laughs> I just, I really appreciate it. I should know these things. <laughs> So does the committee want to um, offer any suggestions or want to take public comment first? I guess we'll take public comment first and come back for the discussion. Julie, did you want to say something before I did that? Okay. Public comment on this item, Maria? Martina, sorry. No problem, sir. <laughs> if there are any members of the public wishing to speak on the current item timeline for in-person, please go ahead and raise your hand in the reactions if you're joining us virtually or press star nine to raise your hand if you're joining us by phone at which you would press star six to speak and sir we do not have any public comments on this item okay bring it back to the committee um i would only say that i think it's important to have hybrid option for the public and leave the uh how the board members attend up to the rest of the group here julie yeah, I guess my view is a little different. I think I agree with what the staff has recommended and we go a little slower and have the hybrid option available for the board members up until the March mandatory um, be there in person. Um, it's going to be a big shift for people's behavior and I think we need to give them a lot of notice and for those who want to come in person that's awesome, but um, I think to make it mandatory pre is right now is a little bit premature. Rachel? Yeah, I mean, my messaging was really around in March, you know, what we're doing, trying to move to that direction. And I think some of it is messaging in terms of we want to conduct our business. I'm finding it now hard if some people are in on, it's, it's like the old way, like what did we do the old way um, prior to having all these different hybrid options? And you always, it does come down to there's better synergy when we're in person, if the majority of the people are in person. If there's only, you know, a couple of people that are online, it's hard. And if you couldn't make a meeting, you couldn't make a meeting. You missed a meeting. And, and so you, and you get your messaging through, um, you know, through the executive, executive officer to share your opinion. Um, so I, I do think it's important that we start moving in that direction. I think there's a big asterisk of we still need to watch the COVID, whatever, you know, everyone has a different sensitivity to where we're at. We don't know what's going to happen this winter. So Julie, to your point, you know, I think we go slow in terms of what's going to happen. Um, and I'm sure, you know, everyone's going to be watching this really carefully in terms of how do we all get back in. But I do find it it's so much more valuable to be in person and absolutely for public to be able to participate by hybrid. But I think when we're talking about conducting business, I think it's it's helpful to be in person. Thank you, Julie. I just wanna say that in my meetings with various board members, everyone is really excited to be meeting in person. So that I don't think that's going to be a problem. Everyone recognizes the synergy and the camaraderie that that is created by being in person. Mark, go ahead. One committee or two committees, I think, that need to be discussed um, in regard to this decision is the Advisory Technical Committee and the Operations Committee, since we are going to be um, spinning up those two committees starting in December, and. Um, I think a slower transition, especially for those two committees and their busy schedules for the um, fire chiefs and city managers and ops, and then our um, pre-fire engineers, as I like to call them for the ATC, um, I, I think a slower transition for them is beneficial. All right, that sounds good. 
can they self decide? I mean, can they? If if we follow three sixty one, yes. Okay. I feel like so, those committees are a little different than. They are. Yeah. yeah. They are. So I'm hearing. I'm hearing we follow staff's recommendation number one. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. And encourage board. I would just encourage board members to attend in person. I think that would be a good good approach. And and I'll add that sentence to the staff report. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. The the, the bottom line though is that we're taking this to. We're not a decision making body. Um, we're we're just making recommendations. So yeah. You know the the ultimate ultimately um, it'll it'll be the board, uh, Dennis, that you'll you'll convene. Yeah. Uh, oversee the this discussion so let's see yeah. what the sentiments are <laughs> yeah if there's no action requirement it'll only be a recommendation so through staff so julie yeah i just wanted to reiterate what rachel said this is really complicated and i find that my mind just kind of starts shutting down when i hear all these numbers and um so I would try to make the staff report as simple and plain vanilla as possible. Will do. Thank you. Yeah. And then Megan, I guess as we take this approach, is there anything that that you want to direct board members in terms of instructions? This really isn't a change, but is there anything they need to know specifically individually related uh, to this change? Thank you for um for that, I think that we will definitely need to spell out sort of here once we go in March. You know, here are your options, and if you want to declare, say that you have an emergency, here are the steps you need to take, and that type of thing. So, yes, we'll work on getting it as synthesized as we can, given the complexity of the law itself. We'll try to simplify, and I I'm to blame for making Mark's staff report more wordy and complicated than maybe it needed to be but uh just wanted to get it all out there that we have these two laws these pieces of the law that we're contending with so like i can work with him on simplifying it too we, we can make the legalese um an attachment to the staff report yeah yeah <laughs> perfect all right bruce um yeah i just wanted to offer that um we went through this yesterday for the nevada fire protection district and our legal counsel did prepare a beautiful uh briefing um, that I think we we should just borrow, and and Megan, if you want to build on that, uh, let's do that. But it's 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 vanilla, Julie. It's it's chocolate <laughs> or vanilla, and uh, it's really good. So I can chase that if if you wish. I can chase that down with your consent. I imagine it'll be on the Nevada website for uh, your board packet. It, um, that's a good question, Mark. I only saw it during the board presentation. Riley Hurd is our legal counsel. Um, Megan can reach out to Riley then. I know him well. I reach out to him. Okay, so you, you want to chase down uh, Riley then, Megan? If if if, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank okay, you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. So we're going to move to item nine now. Board of Directors agenda review. Mark. I think this will be pretty quick. Julie, thank you for catching the um, the date change. We've made that change already. Um, and then the only thing I I I would like to add. Um, to our consent item is um, two additions to the ad hoc non-voting members to advisory technical committee, and that would be Fire Safe Marin. And Fire Safe Marin is specifically listed as one of the recommended agencies for the non-voting ATC members. And then also um, the UC Cooperative Extension. And I've had a great conversation with David Lewis, and he has some ideas who would be the right member from UCCE to be on that. So I was going to reach out to um, Anne and the chair of the ATC, Chief Martin, um, to see if they're good with those recommendations. But it is the board that ultimately approves that. So we are going to bring it to the board as a consent item. And then for the educational item, I, rep I recommend we just basically have a presentation on the annual report as our educational item. Yeah. Good, Mark. Thank you. So questions of Mark from the committee? This is about the upcoming agenda. All right, any, uh, Catherine, go ahead. Okay, this is really picky. You're giving an oral report, not a verbal report. Okay. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. All right, any other questions at this point? Move to the public, Martina. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak on the Board of Directors draft agenda, please raise your hand in the reactions 
if you are joining us virtually and press star nine to raise your hand if you're joining us by phone. And so it does look like we have a comment from Stephen Keese. And Mr. Keese, you should be able to speak. Yes. So Catherine, when you just made your comment, I was I was sitting back here saying, yay, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> and one other comment along that line. Um, the meeting style uh, for the future is hybrid, not hybrid. Hybrid having to do with some sort of thoroughbred type of <laughs> reading. But anyhow, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate that. Thank you so for your comment. And if there are any additional members of the public wishing to speak on the current item, please raise your hand in the reactions and press star nine if you're joining us by phone to raise your hand. And so that is it for our public comments on that item. Thank you. So bring it back to the committee for any further discussion. No action is required. All right, we'll move on to item 10, informational items. Any committee members have information items for the committee? Okay, seeing none, item 11, uh, committee requests for future agenda items. Anything that we need to include in our, yes, Bruce. Um, Mark, and this isn't new to us, but I, I'm just interested in getting an update at some point on the status of the ingress, egress, the evacuation work that's being done. I know it was going to come at us in increments and um, and, and maybe it's just me, but I'm feeling a little disconnected as to the status and um, it, at some point, whether it make this um, a future agenda item or an however you want to handle it, but I, I would like to, to to get an update on that at some point when the timing is 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 right. Absolutely. And we did do a, a literature review um, update in, at the September meeting. Yeah. And so now we are getting into the actual building of the fire and traffic modeling. Yeah. And so when that's ready, we'll definitely give a high level review of that. But we're still in um, digging into that. OK, I know it was just a. Um, it, it took us a lot of discussion to, to, to get this approved and to, to, to get on the course that we're currently on. And, and we're on, it's an amazing product. I'm so proud of it. Uh, so maybe I'm just more curious. Than anything. And we, and I do want to state that we are, um, our timeline is matching the um, proposed timeline. Very good. Anything else under requests for future agenda items? All right. We'll move to item 12 then, which is a closed session, the meeting following this executive committee meeting. As indicated on the agenda, the executive committee has two closed ses session items today, both of which are being convened pursuant to government code 54957.6. A conference with executive officer related is negotiations with the planning and program manager and a conference with the MWPA negotiator, Gene Bonender, related to the negotiations with the executive officer. So this is the time that we take public comment on these items before we move to closed session. Martina? If there are any members of the public wishing to speak on the closed session item only, please raise your hand in the reactions or press star nine to raise your hand if you're joining us by phone. And so we do not have any public comments on this item. Okay, so we'll move to closed session at this point. We'll see you oh. there. I don't know that I have the, uh, okay. could, could someone please send the invite to the goingswines at gmail.com, please? I haven't been on the enough. Not Very long. good. Yes. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, thank you. You should see that in your email. Thank you so much. And as President Rodoni stated a few minutes ago, okay, perfect. Everybody's got it. Hey, Ann. I'm gonna go ahead and share the adjourned closed session uh, screen. See everybody short.
We're back. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the difficulties. No worries. Zoom has not been our friend today. Huh. Where there's MWPA, there is a way. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we've got Catherine and Julie in the attendees line there. Bringing them over now. And then we'll bring over, will we be bringing over Jean also? No need to bring Jean. I think just the members themselves would be great. Okay. okay. Looks like we are back. There's Dennis. Great. So I think we have a quorum here so I can come back from closed session and announce that we have taken no reportable action. And with that, I'm going to announce that we're going to adjourn. So see you at the board meeting on the 17th. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.